Section 4 of State of the Union Addresses, 1837 to 1844. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Martin Van Buren, December 3, 1838, Part 2. The connection which formerly existed between the government and banks was in reality injurious to both, as well as to the general interests of the community at large. It aggravated the disasters of trade and the derangements of commercial intercourse, and administered new excitements and additional means to wild and reckless speculations, the disappointment of which threw the country into convulsions of panic and all but produced violence and bloodshed the imprudent expansion of bank credits which was the natural result of the command of the revenues of the state furnished the resources for unbounded license in every species of adventure seduced industry from its regular and salutary occupations by the hope of abundance without labor and deranged the social state by tempting all trades and professions into the vortex of speculation on remote contingencies the same widespreading influence impeded also the resources of the government, curtailed its useful operations, embarrassed the fulfillment of its obligations, and seriously interfered with the execution of the laws. Large appropriations and oppressive taxes are the natural consequences of such a connection, since they increase the profits of those who are allowed to use the public funds, and make it their interest that money should be accumulated and expenditures multiplied. It is thus that a concentrated money power is tempted to become an active agent in political affairs, and all past experience has shown on which side that influence will be arrayed. We deceive ourselves if we suppose that it will ever be found asserting and supporting the rights of the community at large in opposition to the claims of the few. In a government whose distinguishing characteristic should be a diffusion and equalization of its benefits and burdens, the advantage of individuals will be augmented at the expense of the community at large nor is it the nature of combinations for the acquisition of legislative influence to confine their interference to the single object for which they were originally formed. The temptation to extend it to other matters is, on the contrary, not unfrequently too strong to be resisted. The rightful influence in the direction of public affairs of the mass of the people is therefore in no slight danger of being sensibly and injuriously affected by giving to a comparatively small but efficient class a direct and exclusive personal interest in so important a portion of the legislation of Congress as that which relates to the custody of the public monies. If laws acting upon private interests cannot always be avoided, they should be confined within the narrowest limits, and left wherever possible to the legislatures of the states. When not thus restricted, they lead to combinations of powerful associations, foster an influence necessarily selfish, and turn the fair course of legislation to sinister ends rather than to objects that advance public liberty and promote the general good. The whole subject now rests with you, and I cannot but express a hope that some definite measure will be adopted at the present session. It will not, I am sure, be deemed out of place for me here to remark that the declaration of my views in opposition to the policy of employing banks as depositories of the government funds cannot justly be construed as indicative of hostility, official or personal, to those institutions, or to repeat in this form and in connection with this subject opinions which I have uniformly entertained and on all proper occasions expressed though always opposed to their creation in the form of exclusive privileges and as a state magistrate aiming by appropriate legislation to secure the community against the consequences of their occasional mismanagement i have yet ever wished to see them protected in the exercise of rights conferred by law and have never doubted their utility when properly managed in promoting the interests of trade and through that channel the other interests of the community to the general government they present themselves merely as state institutions having no necessary connection with its legislation or its administration like other state establishments they may be used or not in conducting the affairs of the government as public policy and the general interest of the union may seem to require the only safe or proper principle upon which their intercourse with the government can be regulated is that which regulates their intercourse with the private citizen the conferring of mutual benefits when the government can accomplish a financial operation better with the aid of the banks than without it, it should be at liberty to seek that aid as it would the services of a private banker or other capitalist or agent, giving the preference to those who will serve it on the best terms. 
nor can there ever exist an interest in the officers of the general government as such inducing them to embarrass or annoy the state banks any more than to incur the hostility of any other class of state institutions or of private citizens it is not in the nature of things that hostility to these institutions can spring from this source or any opposition to their course of business except when they themselves depart from the objects of their creation and attempt to usurp powers not conferred upon them or to subvert the standard of value established by the constitution while opposition to their regular operations cannot exist in this quarter resistance to any attempt to make the government dependent upon them for the successful administration of public affairs is a matter of duty as i trust it ever will be of inclination no matter from what motive or consideration the attempt may originate it is no more than just to the banks to say that in the late emergency most of them firmly resisted the strongest temptations to extend their paper issues when apparently sustained in a suspension of specie payments by public opinion even though in some cases invited by legislative enactments to this honorable course aided by the resistance of the general government acting in obedience to the constitution and laws of the united states to the introduction of an irredeemable paper medium may be attributed in a great degree the speedy restoration of our currency to a sound state and the business of the country to its wonted prosperity the banks have but to continue in the same safe course and be content in their appropriate sphere to avoid all interference from the general government and to derive from it all the protection and benefits which it bestows on other state establishments on the people of the states and on the states themselves in this their true position they cannot but secure the confidence and good will of the people and the government which they can only lose when leaping from their legitimate sphere they attempt to control the legislation of the country and to pervert the operations of the government to their own purposes our experience under the act passed at the last session to grant preemption rights to settlers on the public lands has as yet been too limited to enable us to pronounce with safety upon the efficacy of its provisions to carry out the wise and liberal policy of the government in that respect there is however the best reason to anticipate favorable results from its operation the recommendations formerly submitted to you in respect to a graduation of the price of the public lands remain to be finally acted upon having found no reason to change the views then expressed your attention to them is again respectfully requested every proper exertion has been made and will be continued to carry out the wishes of congress in relation to the tobacco trade as indicated in the several resolutions of the house of representatives and the legislation of the two branches a favorable impression has i trust been made in the different foreign countries to which particular attention has been directed and although we cannot hope for an early change in their policy as in many of them a convenient and large revenue is derived from the monopolies in the fabrication and sale of this article yet as these monopolies are really injurious to the people where they are established and the revenue derived from them may be less injuriously and with equal facility obtained from another and a liberal system of administration we cannot doubt that our efforts will be eventually crowned with success if persisted in with temperate firmness and sustained by prudent legislation in recommending to congress the adoption of the necessary provisions at this session for taking the next census or enumeration of the inhabitants of the united states the suggestion presents itself whether the scope of the measure might not be usefully extended by causing it to embrace authentic statistical returns of the great interests specially entrusted to or necessarily affected by the legislation of congress the accompanying report of the secretary of war presents a satisfactory account of the state of the army and of the several branches of the public service confided to the superintendents of that officer the law increasing and organizing the military establishment of the united states has been nearly carried into effect and the army has been extensively and usefully employed during the past season i would again call to your notice the subjects connected with and essential to the military defenses of the country which were submitted to you at the last session but which were not acted upon as is supposed for want of time the most important of them is the organization of the militia on the maritime and inland frontiers this measure is deemed important as it is believed that it will furnish an effective volunteer force in aid of the regular army and may form the basis of a general system of organization for the entire militia of the united states the erection of a national foundry and gunpowder manufactory and one for making small arms the latter to be situated at some point west of the allegheny mountains all appear to be of sufficient importance to be again urged upon your attention 
the plan proposed by the secretary of war for the distribution of the forces of the united states in time of peace is well calculated to promote regularity and economy in the fiscal administration of the service to preserve the discipline of the troops and to render them available for the maintenance of the peace and tranquillity of the country with this view likewise i recommend the adoption of the plan presented by that officer for the defense of the western frontier the preservation of the lives and property of our fellow citizens who are settled upon that border country as well as the existence of the indian population which might be tempted by our want of preparation to rush on their own destruction and attack the white settlements all seem to require that this subject should be acted upon without delay and the war department authorized to place that country in a state of complete defense against any assault from the numerous and warlike tribes which are congregated on that border it affords me sincere pleasure to be able to apprise you of the entire removal of the cherokee nation of indians to their new homes west of the mississippi the measures authorized by congress at its last session with a view to the long-standing controversy with them have had the happiest effects by an agreement concluded with them by the commanding general in that country who has performed the duties assigned to him on the occasion with commendable energy and humanity their removal has been principally under the conduct of their own chiefs and they have emigrated without any apparent reluctance the successful accomplishment of this important object the removal also of the entire creek nation with the exception of a small number of fugitives amongst the seminoles in florida the progress already made toward a speedy completion of the removal of the chickasaws the choctaws the potawatomies the ottawas and the chippewas with the extensive purchases of indian lands during the present year have rendered the speedy and successful result of the long-established policy of the government upon the subject of indian affairs entirely certain the occasion is therefore deemed a proper one to place this policy in such a point of view as will exonerate the government of the united states from the undeserved reproach which has been cast upon it through several successive administrations that a mixed occupancy of the same territory by the white and red man is incompatible with the safety or happiness of either is a position in respect to which there has long since ceased to be room for a difference of opinion reason and experience have alike demonstrated its impracticability the bitter fruits of every attempt heretofore to overwhelm the barriers interposed by nature have only been destruction both physical and moral to the indian dangerous conflicts of authority between the federal and state governments and detriment to the individual prosperity of the citizen as well as to the general improvement of the country the remedial policy the principles of which were settled more than thirty years ago under the administration of mr jefferson consists in an extinction for a fair consideration of the title to all the lands still occupied by the indians within the states and territories of the united states their removal to a country west of the mississippi much more extensive and better adapted to their condition than that on which they then resided the guarantee to them by the united states of their exclusive possession of that country forever exempt from all intrusions by white men with ample provisions for their security against external violence and internal dissensions and the extension to them of suitable facilities for their advancement in civilization this has not been the policy of a particular administrations only but of each in succession since the first attempt to carry it out under that of mr monroe all have labored for its accomplishment only with different degrees of success the manner of its execution has it is true from time to time given rise to conflicts of opinion and unjust imputations but in respect to the wisdom and necessity of the policy itself there has not from the beginning existed a doubt in the mind of any calm judicious disinterested friend of the indian race accustomed to reflection and enlightened by experience occupying the double character of contractor on its own account and guardian for the parties contracted with it was hardly to be expected that the dealings of the federal government with the indian tribes would escape misrepresentation that there occurred ill the early settlement of this country as in all others where the civilized race has succeeded to the possessions of the savage instances of oppression and fraud on the part of the former there is too much reason to believe no such offenses can however be justly charged upon this government since it became free to pursue its own course its dealing with the indian tribes have been just and friendly throughout its efforts for their civilization constant and directed by the best feelings of humanity its watchfulness in protecting them from individual frauds unremitting its forbearance under the keenest provocation the deepest injuries and the most flagrant outrages may challenge at least a comparison with any nation ancient or modern in similar circumstances 
and if in future times a powerful civilized and happy nation of indians shall be found to exist within the limits of this northern continent it will be owing to the consummation of that policy which has been so unjustly assailed only a very brief reference to facts in confirmation of this assertion can in this form be given and you are therefore necessarily referred to the report of the secretary of war for further details to the cherokees whose case has perhaps excited the greatest share of attention and sympathy the united states have granted in fee with a perpetual guarantee of exclusive and peaceable possession thirteen million five hundred fifty four thousand one hundred thirty five acres of land on the west side of the mississippi eligibly situated in a healthy climate and in all respects better suited to their condition than the country they have left in exchange for only nine million four hundred ninety two thousand one hundred sixty acres on the east side of the same river the united states have in addition stipulated to pay them five million six hundred thousand dollars for their interest in and improvements on the lands thus relinquished and one million one hundred sixty thousand dollars for subsistence and other beneficial purposes thereby putting it in their power to become one of the most wealthy and independent separate communities of the same extent in the world by the treaties made and ratified with the miamis the chippewas the sioux the sacs and foxes and the winnebagoes during the last year the indian title to eighteen million four hundred fifty eight thousand acres has been extinguished these purchases have been much more extensive than those of any previous year and have with other indian expenses borne very heavily upon the treasury they leave however but a small quantity of unbought indian lands within the states and territories and the legislative and executive were equally sensible of the propriety of a final and more speedy extinction of indian titles within those limits the treaties which were with a single exception made in pursuance of previous appropriations for defraying the expenses have subsequently been ratified by the senate and received the sanction of congress by the appropriations necessary to carry them into effect of the terms upon which these important negotiations were concluded i can speak from direct knowledge and i feel no difficulty in affirming that the interest of the indians in the extensive territory embraced by them is to be paid for at its fair value and that no more favorable terms have been granted to the united states than would have been reasonably expected in a negotiation with civilized men fully capable of appreciating and protecting their own rights for the indian title to one hundred sixteen million three hundred forty nine thousand eight hundred ninety seven acres acquired since the fourth of march eighteen twenty nine the united states have paid seventy two million five hundred sixty thousand fifty six dollars in permanent annuities lands reservations for indians expenses of removal and subsistence merchandise mechanical and agricultural establishments and implements when the heavy expenses incurred by the united states and the circumstance that so large a portion of the entire territory will be forever unsaleable are considered and this price is compared with that for which the united states sell their own lands no one can doubt that justice has been done to the indians in these purchases also certain it is that the transactions of the federal government with the indians have been uniformly characterized by a sincere and paramount desire to promote their welfare and it must be a source of the highest gratification to every friend to justice and humanity to learn that notwithstanding the obstructions from time to time thrown in its way and the difficulties which have arisen from the peculiar and impracticable nature of the indian character the wise humane and undeviating policy of the government in this the most difficult of all our relations foreign or domestic has at length been justified to the world in its near approach to a happy and certain consummation the condition of the tribes which occupy the country set apart for them in the west is highly prosperous and encourages the hope of their early civilization they have for the most part abandoned the hunter state and turned their attention to agricultural pursuits all those who have been established for any length of time in that fertile region maintain themselves by their own industry there are among them traders of no inconsiderable capital and planters exporting cotton to some extent but the greater number are small agriculturalists living in comfort upon the produce of their farms the recent immigrants although they have in some instances removed reluctantly have readily acquiesced in their unavoidable destiny they have found at once a recompense for past sufferings and an incentive to industrious habits in the abundance and comforts around them there is reason to believe that all these tribes are friendly in their feelings toward the united states and it is to be hoped that the acquisition of individual wealth the pursuits of agriculture and habits of industry will gradually subdue their warlike propensities and incline them to maintain peace among themselves 
to effect this desirable object the attention of congress is solicited to the measures recommended by the secretary of war for their future government and protection as well from each other as from the hostility of the warlike tribes around them and the intrusions of the whites the policy of the government has given them a permanent home and guaranteed to them its peaceful and undisturbed possession it only remains to give them a government and laws which will encourage industry and secure to them the rewards of their exertions the importance of some form of government cannot be too much insisted upon the earliest effects will be to diminish the causes and occasions for hostilities among the tribes to inspire an interest in the observance of laws to which they will have themselves assented and to multiply the securities of property and the motives for self-improvement intimately connected with this subject is the establishment of the military defenses recommended by the secretary of war which have been already referred to without them the government will be powerless to redeem its pledge of protection to the emigrating indians against the numerous warlike tribes that surround them and to provide for the safety of the frontier settlers of the bordering states the case of the seminoles constitutes at present the only exception to the successful efforts of the government to remove the indians to the homes assigned them west of the mississippi four hundred of this tribe emigrated in eighteen thirty six and one thousand five hundred in eighteen thirty seven and eighteen thirty eight leaving in the country it is supposed about two thousand indians the continued treacherous conduct of these people the savage and unprovoked murders they have lately committed butchering whole families of the settlers of the territory without distinction of age or sex and making their way into the very center and heart of the country so that no part of it is free from their ravages their frequent attacks on the lighthouses along that dangerous coast and the barbarity with which they have murdered the passengers and crews of such vessels as have been wrecked upon the reefs and keys which border the gulf leave the government no alternative but to continue the military operations against them until they are totally expelled from florida there are other motives which would urge the government to pursue this course towards the seminoles the united states have fulfilled in good faith all their treaty stipulations with the indian tribes and have in every other instance insisted upon a like performance of their obligations to relax from this salutary rule because the seminoles have maintained themselves so long in the territory they had relinquished and in defiance of their frequent and solemn engagements still continue to wage a ruthless war against the united states would not only evince a want of constancy on our part but be of evil example in our intercourse with other tribes experience has shown that but little is to be gained by the march of armies through a country so intersected with inaccessible swamps and marshes and which from the final character of the climate must be abandoned at the end of winter i recommend therefore to your attention the plan submitted by the secretary of war in the accompanying report for the permanent occupation of the portion of the territory freed from the indians and the more efficient protection of the people of florida from their inhuman warfare from the report of the secretary of the navy herewith transmitted it will appear that a large portion of the disposable naval force is either actively employed or in a state of preparation for the purposes of experience and discipline and the protection of our commerce so effectual has been this protection that so far as the information of the government extends not a single outrage has been attempted on a vessel carrying the flag of the united states within the present year in any quarter however distant or exposed the exploring expedition sailed from norfolk on the nineteenth of august last and information has been received of its safe arrival at the island of madeira the best spirit animates the officers and crews and there is every reason to anticipate from its efforts results beneficial to commerce and honorable to the nation it will also be seen that no reduction of the force now in commission is contemplated the unsettled state of a portion of south america renders it indispensable that our commerce should receive protection in that quarter the vast and increasing interest embarked in the trade of the indian and china seas in the whale fisheries of the pacific ocean and in the gulf of mexico require equal attention to their safety and a small squadron may be employed to great advantage on our atlantic coast in meeting sudden demands for the reinforcement of other stations in aiding merchant vessels in distress in affording active service to an additional number of officers and in visiting the different ports of the united states an accurate knowledge of which is obviously of the highest importance the attention of congress is respectfully called to that portion of the report recommending an increase in the number of smaller vessels and to other suggestions contained in that document the rapid increase and wide expansion of our commerce which is every day seeking new avenues of profitable adventure the absolute necessity of a naval force for its protection precisely in the degree of its extension a due regard to the national rights and honor the recollection of its former exploits and the anticipation of its future triumphs whenever opportunity presents itself 
which we may rightfully indulge from the experience of the past all seem to point to the navy as a most efficient arm of our national defense and a proper object of legislative encouragement the progress and condition of the post office department will be seen by reference to the report of the postmaster general the extent of post roads covered by mail contracts is stated to be one hundred thirty four thousand eight hundred eighteen miles and the annual transportation upon them thirty four million five hundred eighty thousand two hundred two miles the number of post offices in the united states is twelve thousand five hundred fifty three and rapidly increasing the gross revenue for the year ending on the thirtieth day of june was four million two hundred sixty two thousand one hundred forty five dollars the accruing expenditures four million six hundred eighty thousand sixty eight dollars excess of expenditures four hundred seventeen thousand nine hundred twenty three dollars this has been made up out of the surplus previously on hand the cash on hand on the first instant was three hundred fourteen thousand sixty eight dollars the revenue for the year ending june thirtieth eighteen thirty eight was one hundred sixty one thousand five hundred forty dollars more than that for the year ending june thirtieth eighteen thirty seven the expenditures of the department have been graduated upon the anticipation of a largely increased revenue a moderate curtailment of mail service consequently became necessary and has been effected to shield the department against the danger of embarrassment its revenue is now improving and it will soon resume its onward course in the march of improvement your particular attention is requested to so much of the postmaster general's report as relates to the transportation of the mails upon railroads the laws on that subject do not seem adequate to secure that service now become almost essential to the public interests and at the same time protect the department from combinations and unreasonable demands nor can i too earnestly request your attention to the necessity of providing a more secure building for this department the danger of destruction to which its important books and papers are continually exposed as well from the highly combustible character of the building occupied as from that of others in the vicinity calls loudly for prompt action your attention is again earnestly invited to the suggestions and recommendations submitted at the last session in respect to the district of columbia i feel it is my duty also to bring to your notice certain proceedings at law which have recently been prosecuted in this district in the name of the united states on the relation of messrs stockton and stokes of the state of maryland against the postmaster general and which have resulted in the payment of money out of the national treasury for the first time since the establishment of the government by judicial compulsion exercised by the common law writ of mandamus issued by the circuit court of this district the facts of the case and the grounds of the proceedings will be found fully stated in the report of the decision and any additional information which you may desire will be supplied by the proper department no interference in the particular case is contemplated the money has been paid the claims of the prosecutors have been satisfied and the whole subject so far as they are concerned is finally disposed of but it is on the supposition that the case may be regarded as an authoritative exposition of the law as it now stands that i have thought it necessary to present it to your consideration the object of the application to the circuit court was to compel the postmaster general to carry into effect an award made by the solicitor of the treasury under a special act of congress for the settlement of certain claims of the relators on the post office department which award the postmaster general declined to execute in full until he should receive further legislative direction on the subject if the duty imposed on the postmaster general by that law was to be regarded as one of an official nature belonging to his office as a branch of the executive then it is obvious that the constitutional competency of the judiciary to direct and control him in its discharge was necessarily drawn in question and if the duty so imposed on the postmaster general was to be considered as merely ministerial and not executive it yet remained to be shown that the circuit court of this district had authority to interfere by mandamus such a power having never before been asserted or claimed by that court with a view to the settlement of these important questions the judgment of the circuit court was carried by a writ of error to the supreme court of the united states in the opinion of that tribunal the duty imposed on the postmaster general was not an official executive duty but one of a merely ministerial nature the grave constitutional questions which had been discussed were therefore excluded from the decision of the case the court indeed expressly admitting that with powers and duties properly belonging to the executive no other department can interfere by the writ of mandamus and the question therefore resolved itself into this has congress conferred upon the circuit court of this district the power to issue such a writ to an officer of the general government commanding him to perform a ministerial act 
a majority of the court have decided that it has but have rounded their decision upon a process of reasoning which in my judgment renders further legislative provision indispensable to the public interests and the equal administration of justice it has long since been decided by the supreme court that neither that tribunal nor the circuit courts of the united states held within the respective states possess the power in question but it is now held that this power denied to both of these higher tribunals to the former by the constitution and to the latter by congress has been by its legislation vested in the circuit court of this district no such direct grant of power to the circuit court of this district is claimed but it has been held to result by necessary implication from several sections of the law establishing the court one of these sections declares that the laws of maryland as they existed at the time of the session should be in force in that part of the district ceded by that state and by this provision the common law in civil and criminal cases as it prevailed in maryland in eighteen o one was established in that part of the district in england the court of the king's bench because the sovereign who according to the theory of the constitution is the fountain of justice originally sat there in person and is still deemed to be present in construction of law alone possesses the high power of issuing the writ of mandamus not only to inferior jurisdictions and corporations but also to magistrates and others commanding them in the king's name to do what their duty requires in cases where there is a vested right and no other specific remedy it has been held in the case referred to that as the supreme court of the united states is by the constitution rendered incompetent to exercise this power and as the circuit court of this district is a court of general jurisdiction in cases at common law and the highest court of original jurisdiction in the district the right to issue the writ of mandamus is incident to its common law powers another ground relied upon to maintain the power in question is that it was included by fair construction in the powers granted to the circuit courts of the united states by act quote, to provide for the more convenient organization of the courts of the united states end quote, passed thirteenth february eighteen o one that the act establishing the circuit court of this district passed the twenty seventh day of february eighteen o one conferred upon that court and the judges thereof the same powers as were by law vested in the circuit courts of the united states and in the judges of the said courts that the repeal of the first mentioned act which took place in the next year did not divest the circuit court of this district of the authority in dispute but left it still clothed with the powers over the subject which it is conceded were taken away from the circuit courts of the united states by the repeal of the act of thirteenth february eighteen o one admitting that the adoption of the laws of maryland for a portion of this district confers on the circuit court thereof in that portion the transcendent extrajudicial prerogative powers of the court of king's bench in england or that either of the acts of congress by necessary implication authorizes the former court to issue a writ of mandamus to an officer of the united states to compel him to perform a ministerial duty the consequences are in one respect the same the result in either case is that the officers of the united states stationed in different parts of the united states are in respect to the performance of their official duties subject to different laws and a different supervision those in the states to one rule and those in the district of columbia to another and a very different one in the district their official conduct is subject to a judicial control from which in the states they are exempt whatever difference of opinion may exist as to the expediency of vesting such a power in the judiciary in a system of government constituted like that of the united states all must agree that these disparaging discrepancies in the law and in the administration of justice ought not to be permitted to continue and as congress alone can provide the remedy the subject is unavoidably presented to your consideration m van buren end of section four Section 5 of State of the Union Addresses, 1837-1844. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Section 5. Martin Van Buren, December 2, 1839, Part 1. Fellow Citizens of the Senate and House of Representatives, i regret that i cannot on this occasion congratulate you that the past year has been one of unalloyed prosperity the ravages of fire and disease have painfully afflicted otherwise flourishing portions of our country and serious embarrassments yet derange the trade of many of our cities 
but notwithstanding these adverse circumstances that general prosperity which has been heretofore so bountifully bestowed upon us by the author of all good still continues to call for our warmest gratitude especially have we reason to rejoice in the exuberant harvest which have lavishly recompensed well-directed industry and given to it that sure reward which is vainly sought in visionary speculations i cannot indeed view without peculiar satisfaction the evidences afforded by the past season of the benefits that spring from the steady devotion of the husbandman to his honourable pursuit no means of individual comfort is more certain and no source of national prosperity is so sure nothing can compensate a people for dependence upon others for the bread they eat and that cheerful abundance on which the happiness of every one so much depends is to be looked for nowhere with such sure reliance as in the industry of the agriculturalist and the bounties of the earth with foreign countries our relations exhibit the same favorable aspect which was presented in my last annual message and afford continued proof of the wisdom of the pacific just and forbearing policy adopted by the first administration of the federal government and pursued by its successors the extraordinary powers vested in me by an act of congress for the defense of the country in an emergency considered so far probable as to require that the executive should possess ample means to meet it have not been exerted they have therefore been attended with no other result than to increase by the confidence thus reposed in me my obligations to maintain with religious exactness the cardinal principles that govern our intercourse with other nations happily in our pending questions with great britain out of which this unusual grant of authority arose nothing has occurred to require its exertion and as it is about to return to the legislature i trust that no future necessity may call for its exercise by them or its delegation to another department of the government for the settlement of our northeastern boundary the proposition promised by great britain for a commission of exploration and survey has been received and a counter project including also a provision for the certain and final adjustment of the limits in dispute is now before the british government for its consideration a just regard to the delicate state of this question and a proper respect for the natural impatience of the state of maine not less than a conviction that the negotiation has been already protracted longer than is prudent on the part of either government have led me to believe that the present favorable moment should on no account be suffered to pass without putting the question forever at rest i feel confident that the government of her britannic majesty will take the same view of this subject as i am persuaded it is governed by desires equally strong and sincere for the amicable termination of the controversy to the intrinsic difficulties of questions of boundary lines especially those described in regions unoccupied and but partially known is to be added in our country the embarrassment necessarily arising out of our constitution by which the general government is made the organ of negotiating and deciding upon the particular interest of the states on whose frontier these lines are to be traced to avoid another controversy in which a state government might rightfully claim to have her wishes consulted previously to the conclusion of conventional arrangements concerning her rights of jurisdiction or territory i have thought it necessary to call the attention of the government of great britain to another portion of our conterminous dominion of which the division still remains to be adjusted i refer to the line from the entrance of lake superior to the most northwestern point of the lake of the woods stipulations for the settlement of which are to be found in the seventh article of the treaty of ghent the commissioners appointed under that article by the two governments having differed in their opinions made separate reports according to its stipulations upon the points of disagreement and these differences are now to be submitted to the arbitration of some friendly sovereign or state the disputed points should be settled and the line designated before the territorial government of which it is one of the boundaries takes its place in the union as a state and i rely upon the cordial cooperation of the british government to effect that object there is every reason to believe that disturbances like those which lately agitated the neighboring british provinces will not again prove the source of border contentions or interpose obstacles to the continuance of that good understanding which is the mutual interest of great britain and the united states to preserve and maintain within the provinces themselves tranquillity is restored and on our frontier that misguided sympathy in favor of what was presumed to be a general effort in behalf of popular rights and which in some instances misled a few of our more inexperienced citizens has subsided into a rational conviction strongly opposed to all intermeddling with the internal affairs of our neighbors the people of the united states feel as it is hoped they always will a warm solicitude for the success of all who are sincerely endeavoring to improve the political condition of mankind 
this generous feeling they cherished toward the most distant nations and it was natural therefore that it should be awakened with more than common worth in behalf of their immediate neighbors but it does not belong to their character as a community to seek the gratification of those feelings in acts which violate their duty as citizens endanger the peace of their country and tend to bring upon it the stain of a violated faith toward forward nations if zealous to confer benefits on others they appear for a moment to lose sight of the permanent obligations imposed upon them as citizens they are seldom long misled from all the information i receive confirmed to some extent by personal observation i am satisfied that no one can now hope to engage in such enterprises without encountering public indignation in addition to the severest penalties of the law recent information also leads me to hope that the immigrants from her majesty's provinces who have sought refuge within our boundaries are disposed to become peaceable residents and to abstain from all attempts to endanger the peace of that country which has afforded them an asylum on a review of the occurrences on both sides of the line it is satisfactory to reflect that in almost every complaint against our country the offence may be traced to immigrants from the provinces who have sought refuge here in the few instances in which they were aided by citizens of the united states the acts of these misguided men were not only in direct contravention of the laws and well-known wishes of their own government but met with the decided disapprobation of the people of the united states i regret to state the appearance of a different spirit among her majesty's subjects in the canadas the sentiments of hostility to our people and institutions which have been so frequently expressed there and the disregard of our rights which has been manifested on some occasions have i am sorry to say been applauded and encouraged by the people and even by some of the subordinate local authorities of the provinces the chief officers in canada fortunately have not entertained the same feeling and have probably prevented excesses that must have been fatal to the peace of the two countries i look forward anxiously to a period when all the transactions which have grown out of this condition of our affairs and which have been made the subjects of complaint and remonstrance by the two governments respectively shall be fully examined and the proper satisfaction given where it is due from either side nothing has occurred to disturb the harmony of our intercourse with austria belgium denmark france naples portugal prussia russia or sweden the internal state of spain has sensibly improved and a well-grounded hope exists that the return of peace will restore to the people of that country their former prosperity and enable the government to fulfil all its obligations at home and abroad the government of portugal i have the satisfaction to state has paid in full the eleventh and last installment due to our citizens for the claims embraced in the settlement made with it on the third of march eighteen thirty seven i lay before you treaties of commerce negotiated with the kings of sardinia and of the netherlands the ratifications of which have been exchanged since the adjournment of congress the liberal principles of these treaties will recommend them to your approbation that with sardinia is the first treaty of commerce formed by that kingdom and it will i trust answer the expectations of the present sovereign by aiding the development of the resources of his country and stimulating the enterprise of his people that with the netherlands happily terminates a long existing subject of dispute and removes from our future commercial intercourse all apprehension of embarrassment the king of the netherlands has also in further illustration of his character for justice and of his desire to remove every cause of dissatisfaction made compensation for an american vessel captured in eighteen hundred by a french privateer and carried into caracoa where the proceeds were appropriated to the use of the colony then and for a short time after under the dominion of holland the death of the late sultan has produced no alteration in our relations with turkey our newly appointed minister resident has reached constantinople and i have received assurances from the present ruler that the obligations of our treaty and those of the friendship will be fulfilled by himself in the same spirit that actuated his illustrious father i regret to be obliged to inform you that no convention for the settlement of the claims of our citizens upon mexico has yet been ratified by the government of that country the first convention formed for that purpose was not presented by the president of mexico for the approbation of its congress from a belief that the king of prussia the arbitrator in case of disagreement in the joint commission to be appointed by the united states and mexico would not consent to take upon himself that friendly office although not entirely satisfied with the course pursued by mexico i felt no hesitation in receiving in the most conciliatory spirit the explanation offered and also cheerfully consented to a new convention in order to arrange the payments proposed to be made to our citizens in a manner which while equally just to them was deemed less onerous and inconvenient to the mexican government 
relying confidently upon the intentions of that government mr ellis was directed to repair to mexico and diplomatic intercourse has been resumed between the two countries the new convention has he informs us been recently submitted by the president of that republic to its congress under circumstances which promise a speedy ratification a result which i cannot allow myself to doubt instructions have been given to the commissioner of the united states under our convention with texas for the demarcation of the line which separates us from that republic the commissioners of both governments met in new orleans in august last the joint commission was organized and adjourned to convene at the same place on the twelfth of october it is presumed to be now in the performance of its duties the new government of texas has shown its desire to cultivate friendly relations with us by a prompt reparation for injuries complained of in the cases of two vessels of the united states with central america a convention has been concluded for the renewal of its former treaty with the united states this was not ratified before the departure of our late charge d'affaires from that country and the copy of it brought by him was not received before the adjournment of the senate at the last session in the meanwhile the period limited for the exchange of ratifications having expired i deemed it expedient in consequence of the death of the charge d'affaires to send a special agent to central america to close the affairs of our mission there and to arrange with the government an extension of the time for the exchange of ratifications the commission created by the states which formerly composed the republic of colombia for adjusting the claims against that government has by a very unexpected construction of the treaty under which it acts decided that no provision was made for those claims of citizens of the united states which arose from captures by colombian privateers and were adjudged against the claimants in the judicial tribunals this decision will compel the united states to apply to the several governments formerly united for redress with all these new granada venezuela and ecuador a perfectly good understanding exists our treaty with venezuela is faithfully carried into execution and that country in the enjoyment of tranquillity is gradually advancing in prosperity under the guidance of its present distinguished president general paez with ecuador a liberal commercial convention has lately been concluded which will be transmitted to the senate at an early day with the great american empire of brazil our relations continue unchanged as does our friendly intercourse with the other governments of south america the argentine republic and the republics of uruguay chile peru and bolivia the dissolution of the peru bolivian confederation may occasion some temporary inconvenience to our citizens in that quarter but the obligations on the new governments which have arisen out of that confederation to observe its treaty stipulations will no doubt be soon understood and it is presumed that no indisposition will exist to fulfil those which it contracted with the united states the financial operations of the government during the present year have i am happy to say been very successful the difficulties under which the treasury department has labored from known defects in the existing laws relative to the safe keeping of the public monies aggravated by the suspension of specie payments by several of the banks holding public deposits or indebted to public officers for notes received in payment of public dues have been surmounted to a very gratifying extent the large current expenditures have been punctually met and the faith of the government in all its pecuniary concerns has been scrupulously maintained the nineteen millions of treasury notes authorized by the act of congress of eighteen thirty seven and the modifications thereof with a view to the indulgence of merchants on their duty bonds and of the deposit banks in the payment of public monies held by them have been so punctually redeemed as to leave less than the original ten millions outstanding at any one time and the whole amount unredeemed now falls short of three millions of these the chief portion is not due till next year and the whole would have been already extinguished could the treasury have realized the payments due to it from the banks if those due from them during the next year shall be punctually made and if congress shall keep the appropriations within the estimates there is every reason to believe that all the outstanding treasury notes can be redeemed and the ordinary expenses defrayed without imposing on the people any additional burden either of loans or increased taxes to avoid this and to keep the expenditures within reasonable bounds is a duty second only in importance to the preservation of our national character and the protection of our citizens in their civil and political rights the creation in time of peace of a debt likely to become permanent is an evil for which there is no equivalent the rapidity with which many of the states are apparently approaching to this condition admonishes us of our own duties in a manner too impressive to be disregarded 
one not the least important is to keep the federal government always in a condition to discharge with ease and vigor its highest functions should their exercise be required by any sudden conjuncture of public affairs a condition to which we are always exposed and which may occur when it is least expected to this end it is indispensable that its finances should be untrammeled and its resources as far as practicable unencumbered no circumstance could present greater obstacles to the accomplishment of these vitally important objects than the creation of an onerous national debt our own experience and also that of other nations have demonstrated the unavoidable and fearful rapidity with which a public debt is increased when the government has once surrendered itself to the ruinous practice of supplying its supposed necessities by new loans the struggle therefore on our part to be successful must be made at the threshold to make our efforts effective severe economy is necessary this is the surest provision for the national welfare and it is at the same time the best preservative of the principles on which our institutions rest simplicity and economy in the affairs of state have never failed to chasten and invigorate republican principles while these have been as surely subverted by national prodigality under whatever specious pretext it may have been introduced or fostered these considerations cannot be lost upon a people who have never been inattentive to the effect of their policy upon the institutions they have created for themselves but at the present moment their force is augmented by the necessity which a decreasing revenue must impose the check lately given to importations of articles subject to duties the derangements in the operations of internal trade and especially the reduction gradually taking place in our tariff of duties all tend materially to lessen our receipts it is probable that the diminution resulting from the last cause alone will not fall short of five million in the year eighteen forty two as the final reduction of all duties to twenty per cent then takes effect the whole revenue then accruing from the customs and from the sales of public lands if not more will undoubtedly be wanted to defray the necessary expenses of the government under the most prudent administration of its affairs these are circumstances that impose the necessity of rigid economy and require its prompt and constant exercise with the legislature rests the power and duty of so adjusting the public expenditure as to promote this end by the provisions of the constitution it is only in consequence of appropriations made by law that money can be drawn from the treasury no instance has occurred since the establishment of the government in which the executive through a component part of the legislative power has interposed an objection to an appropriation bill on the sole ground of its extravagance his duty in this respect has been considered fulfilled by requesting such appropriations only as the public service may be reasonably expected to require in the present earnest direction of the public mind toward this subject both the executive and the legislature have evidence of the strict responsibility to which they will be held and while i am conscious of my own anxious efforts to perform with fidelity this portion of my public functions it is a satisfaction to me to be able to count on a cordial cooperation from you at the time i entered upon my present duties our ordinary disbursements without including those on account of the public debt the post office and the trust funds in charge of the government had been largely increased by appropriations for the removal of the indians for repelling indian hostilities and for other less urgent expenses which grew out of an overflowing treasury independent of the redemption of the public debt and trust the gross expenditures of seventeen and eighteen millions in eighteen thirty four and eighteen thirty five had by these causes swelled to twenty nine millions in eighteen thirty six and the appropriations for eighteen thirty seven made previously to the fourth of march caused the expenditure to rise to the very large amount of thirty three millions we were enabled during the year of eighteen thirty eight notwithstanding the continuance of our indian embarrassments somewhat to reduce this amount and that for the present year eighteen thirty nine will not in all probability exceed twenty six millions or six millions less than it was last year with a determination so far as depends on me to continue this reduction i have directed the estimates for eighteen forty to be subjected to the severe scrutiny and to be limited to the absolute requirements of the public service they will be found less than the expenditures of eighteen thirty nine by over five million the precautionary measures which will be recommended by the secretary of the treasury to protect faithfully the public credit under the fluctuations and contingencies to which our receipts and expenditures are exposed and especially in a commercial crisis like the present are commended to your early attention on a former occasion your attention was invited to various considerations in support of a preemption law in behalf of the settlers on the public lands and also of a law graduating the prices for such lands as had long been in the market unsold in consequence of their inferior quality 
the execution of the act which was passed on the first subject has been attended with the happiest consequences in quieting titles and securing improvements to the industrious and it has also to a very gratifying extent been exempt from the frauds which were practised under previous preemption laws it has at the same time as was anticipated contributed liberally during the present year to the receipts of the treasury the passage of a graduation law with the guards before recommended would also i am persuaded add considerably to the revenue for several years and prove in other respects just and beneficial your early consideration of the subject is therefore once more earnestly requested end of section five recording by mark warner Section 6 of State of the Union Addresses, 1837 to 1844. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. Martin Van Buren, December 2, 1839, Part 2. The present condition of the defenses of our principal seaports and navy yards as represented by the accompanying report of the secretary of war calls for the early and serious attention of congress and as connecting itself intimately with this subject i cannot recommend too strongly to your consideration the plan submitted by that officer for the organization of the militia of the united states in conformity with the expressed wishes of congress an attempt was made in the spring to terminate the florida war by negotiation it is to be regretted that these humane intentions should have been frustrated and that the effort to bring these unhappy difficulties to a satisfactory conclusion should have failed but after entering into solemn engagements with the commanding general the indians without any provocation recommenced their acts of treachery and murder the renewal of hostilities in that territory renders it necessary that i should recommend to your favorable consideration the plan which will be submitted to you by the secretary of war in order to enable that department to conduct them to a successful issue having had an opportunity of personally inspecting a portion of the troops during the last summer it gives me pleasure to bear testimony to the success of the effort to improve their discipline by keeping them together in as large bodies as the nature of our service will permit i recommend therefore that commodious and permanent barracks be constructed at the several posts designated by the secretary of war notwithstanding the high state of their discipline and excellent police the evils resulting to the service from the deficiency of company officers were very apparent and i recommend that the staff officers be permanently separated from the line the navy has been usefully and honorably employed in protecting the rights and property of our citizens wherever the condition of affairs seemed to require its presence with the exception of one instance where an outrage accompanied by murder was committed on a vessel of the united states while engaged in a lawful commerce nothing is known to have occurred to impede or molest the enterprise of our citizens on that element where it is so signally displayed on learning this daring act of piracy commodore reed proceeded immediately to the spot and receiving no satisfaction either in the surrender of the murderers or the restoration of the plundered property inflicted severe and merited chastisement on the barbarians it will be seen by the report of the secretary of the navy respecting the disposition of our ships of war that it has been deemed necessary to station a competent force on the coast of africa to prevent a fraudulent use of our flag by foreigners recent experience has shown that the provisions in our existing laws which relate to the sale and transfer of american vessels while abroad are extremely defective advantage has been taken of these defects to give vessels wholly belonging to foreigners and navigating the ocean an apparent american ownership this character has been so well simulated as to afford them comparative security in prosecuting the slave trade a traffic emphatically denounced in our statutes regarded with abhorrence by our citizens and of which the effectual suppression is nowhere more sincerely desired than in the united states these circumstances make it proper to recommend to your early attention a careful revision of these laws so that without impeding the freedom and facilities of our navigation or impairing an important branch of our industry connected with it the integrity and honor of our flag may be carefully preserved information derived from our consul at havana showing the necessity of this was communicated to a committee of the senate near the close of the last session but too late as it appeared to be acted upon 
it will be brought to your notice by the proper department with additional communications from other sources the latest accounts from the exploring expedition represent it as proceeding successfully in its objects and promising results no less useful to trade and navigation than to science the extent of post roads covered by mail service on the first of july last was about one hundred thirty three thousand nine hundred ninety nine miles and the rate of annual transportation upon them thirty four million four hundred ninety six thousand eight hundred seventy eight miles the number of post offices on that day was twelve thousand seven hundred eighty and on the thirtieth ultimo thirteen thousand twenty eight the revenue of the post office department for the year ending with the thirtieth of june last was four million four hundred seventy six thousand six hundred thirty eight dollars exhibiting an increase over the preceding year of two hundred forty one thousand five hundred sixty dollars the engagements and liabilities of the department for the same period are four million six hundred twenty four thousand one hundred seventeen dollars the excess of liabilities over the revenue for the last two years has been met out of the surplus which had previously accumulated the cash on hand on the thirtieth ultimo was about two hundred six thousand seven hundred one dollars and ninety five cents and the current income of the department varies very little from the rate of current expenditures most of the service suspended last year has been restored and most of the new routes established by the act of seventh july eighteen thirty eight have been set in operation at an annual cost of one hundred thirty six thousand nine hundred sixty three dollars notwithstanding the pecuniary difficulties of the country the revenue of the department appears to be increasing and unless it shall be seriously checked by the recent suspension of payment by so many of the banks it will be able not only to maintain the present mail service but in a short time to extend it it is gratifying to witness the promptitude and fidelity with which the agents of this department in general perform their public duties some difficulties have arisen in relation to contracts for the transportation of the mails by railroad and steamboat companies it appears that the maximum of compensation provided by congress for the transportation of the mails upon railroads is not sufficient to induce some of the companies to convey them at such hours are required for the accommodation of the public it is one of the most important duties of the general government to provide and maintain for the use of the people of the states the best practicable mail establishment to arrive at that end it is indispensable that the post office department shall be enabled to control the hours at which the mails shall be carried over railroads as it now does over all other roads should serious inconveniences arise from the inadequacy of the compensation now provided by law or from unreasonable demands by any of the railroad companies the subject is of such general importance as to require the prompt attention of congress in relation to steamboat lines the most efficient remedy is obvious and has been suggested by the postmaster general the war and navy departments already employ steamboats in their service and although it is by no means desirable that the government should undertake the transportation of passengers or freight as a business there can be no reasonable objection to running boats temporarily whenever it may be necessary to put down attempts at extortion to be discontinued as soon as reasonable contracts can be obtained the suggestions of the postmaster general relative to the inadequacy of the legal allowance to witnesses in cases of prosecutions for mail depredations merit your serious consideration the safety of the mails requires that such prosecution shall be efficient and justice to the citizen whose time is required to be given to the public demands not only that his expenses shall be paid but that he shall receive a reasonable compensation the reports from the war navy and post office departments will accompany this communication and one from the treasury department will be presented to congress in a few days for various details in respect to the matters in charge of these departments i would refer you to those important documents satisfied that you will find in them many valuable suggestions which will be found well deserving the attention of the legislature from a report made in december of last year by the secretary of state to the senate showing the trial docket of each of the circuit courts and the number of miles each judge has to travel in the performance of his duties a great inequality appears in the amount of labor assigned to each judge the number of terms to be held in each of the courts comprising the ninth circuit the distances between the places at which they sit and from thence to the seat of government are represented to be such as to render it impossible for the judge of that circuit to perform in a manner corresponding with the public exigencies his term and circuit duties 
a revision therefore of the present arrangement of the circuit seems to be called for and is recommended to your notice i think it proper to call to your attention the power assumed by territorial legislatures to authorize the issue of bonds by corporate companies on the guarantee of the territory congress passed a law in eighteen thirty six providing that no act of a territorial legislature incorporating banks should have the force of law until approved by congress but acts of a very exceptionable character previously passed by the legislature of florida were suffered to remain in force by virtue of which bonds may be issued to a very large amount by those institutions upon the faith of the territory a resolution intending to be a joint one passed the senate at the same session expressing the sense of congress that the laws in question ought not to be permitted to remain in force unless amended in many material respects but it failed in the house of representatives for want of time and the desired amendments have not been made the interests involved are of great importance and the subject deserves your early and careful attention the continued agitation of the question relative to the best mode of keeping and dispersing the public money still injuriously affects the business of the country the suspension of specie payments in eighteen thirty seven rendered the use of deposit banks as prescribed by the act of eighteen thirty six a source rather of embarrassment than aid and of necessity placed the custody of most of the public money afterwards collected in charge of the public officers the new securities for its safety which this required were a principal cause of my convening an extra session of congress but in consequence of a disagreement between the two houses neither then nor at any subsequent period has there been any legislation on the subject the effort made at the last session to obtain the authority of congress to punish the use of public money for private purposes as a crime a measure attended under other governments with signal advantage was also unsuccessful from diversities of opinion in that body notwithstanding the anxiety doubtless felt by it to afford every practicable security the result of this is still to leave the custody of the public money without those safeguards which have been for several years earnestly desired by the executive and as the remedy is only to be found in the action of the legislature it imposes on me the duty of again submitting to you the propriety of passing a law providing for the safe keeping of the public monies and especially to ask that its use for private purposes by any officers entrusted with it may be declared to be a felony punishable with penalties proportioned to the magnitude of the offence these circumstances added to known defects in the existing laws and unusual derangement in the general operations of trade have during the last three years much increased the difficulties attendant on the collection keeping and disbursement of the revenue and called forth corresponding exertions from those having them in charge happily these have been successful beyond expectation vast sums have been collected and dispersed by the several departments with unexpected cheapness and ease transfers have been readily made to every part of the union however distant and defalcations have been far less than might have been anticipated from the absence of adequate legal restraints since the officers of the treasury and post office departments were charged with the custody of most of the public monies received by them there have been collected sixty six million dollars and excluding the case of the late collector at new york the aggregate amount of losses sustained in the collection cannot it is believed exceed sixty thousand dollars the defalcation of the late collector at that city of the extent and circumstances of which congress have been fully informed ran through all the modes of keeping the public money that have been hitherto in use and was distinguished by an aggravated disregard of duty that broke through the restraints of every system and cannot therefore be usefully referred to as a test of the comparative safety of either additional information will also be furnished by the report of the secretary of the treasury in reply to a call made upon that officer by the house of representatives at the last session requiring detailed information on the subject of defaults by public officers or agents under each administration from seventeen eighty nine to eighteen thirty seven this document will be submitted to you in a few days the general results independent of the post office which is kept separately and will be stated by itself so far as they bear upon this subject are that the losses which have been and are likely to be sustained by any class of agents have been the greatest by banks including as required in the resolution their depreciated paper for receiving public dues that the next largest have been by dispersing officers and the least by collectors and receivers if the losses on duty bonds are included they alone will be threefold those by both collectors and receivers our whole experience therefore furnishes the strongest evidence that the desired legislation of congress is alone wanting to ensure 
in those operations the highest degree of security and facility such also appears to have been the experience of other nations from the results of inquiries made by the secretary of the treasury in regard to the practice among them i am enabled to state that in twenty-two out of twenty-seven foreign governments from which undoubted information has been obtained the public monies are kept in charge of public officers this concurrence of opinion in favor of that system is perhaps as great as exists on any questions of internal administration in the modes of business and official restraint on dispersing officers no legal change was produced by the suspension of specie payments the report last referred to will be found to contain also much useful information in relation to this subject i have heretofore assigned to congress my reasons for believing that the establishment of an independent national treasury as contemplated by the constitution is necessary to the safe action of the federal government the suspension of specie payments in eighteen thirty seven by the banks having the custody of the public money showed in so alarming a degree our dependence on those institutions for the performance of duties required by law that i then recommended the entire dissolution of that connection this recommendation has been subjected as i desired it should be to severe scrutiny and animated discussion and i allow myself to believe that notwithstanding the natural diversities of opinion which may be anticipated on all subjects involving such important considerations it has secured in its favor as general a concurrence of public sentiment as could be expected on one of such magnitude recent events have also continued to develop new objections to such a connection seldom is any bank under the existing system and practice able to meet on demand all its liabilities for deposits and notes in circulation it maintains specie payments and transacts a profitable business only by the confidence of the public in its solvency and whenever this is destroyed the demands of its depositors and note holders pressed more rapidly than it can make collections from its debtors force it to stop payment this loss of confidence with its consequences occurred in eighteen thirty seven and afforded the apology of the banks for their suspension the public then acquiesced in the validity of the excuse and while the state legislatures did not exact from them their forfeited charters congress in accordance with the recommendation of the executive allowed them time to pay over the public money they held although compelled to issue treasury notes to supply the deficiency thus created it now appears that there are other motives than a want of public confidence under which the banks seek to justify themselves in a refusal to meet their obligations scarcely were the country and government relieved in a degree from the difficulties occasioned by the general suspension of eighteen thirty seven when a partial one occurring within thirty months of the former produced new and serious embarrassments though it had no palliation in such circumstances as were alleged in justification of that which had previously taken place there was nothing in the condition of the country to endanger a well-managed banking institution commerce was deranged by no foreign war every branch of manufacturing industry was crowned with rich rewards and the more than usual abundance of our harvests after supplying our domestic wants has left our granaries and storehouses filled with a surplus for exportation it is in the midst of this that an irredeemable and depreciated paper currency is entailed upon the people by a large portion of the banks they are not driven to it by the exhibition of a loss of public confidence or of a sudden pressure from their depositors or note holders but they excuse themselves by alleging that the current of business in exchange with foreign countries which draws the precious metals from their vaults would require in order to meet it a larger curtailment of their loans to a comparatively small portion of the community than it will be convenient for them to bear or perhaps safe for the banks to exact the plea has ceased to be one of necessity convenience and policy are now deemed sufficient to warrant these institutions in disregarding their solemn obligations such conduct is not merely an injury to individual creditors but it is a wrong to the whole community from whose liberality they hold most valuable privileges whose rights they violate whose business they derange and the value of whose property they render unstable and insecure it must be evident that this new ground for bank suspensions in reference to which their action is not only disconnected with but wholly independent of that of the public gives a character to their suspensions more alarming than any which they exhibited before and greatly increases the impropriety of relying on the banks in the transactions of the government a large and highly respectable portion of our banking institutions are it affords me unfeigned pleasure to state exempted from all blame on account of this second delinquency 
they have to their great credit not only continued to meet their engagements but have even repudiated the grounds of suspension now resorted to it is only by such a course that the confidence and goodwill of the community can be preserved and in the sequel the best interests of the institutions themselves promoted end of section six section seven of state of the union addresses eighteen thirty seven to eighteen forty four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by k hand martin van buren december second eighteen thirty nine part three new dangers to the banks are also daily disclosed from the extension of that system of extravagant credit of which they are the pillars formerly our foreign commerce was principally rounded on an exchange of commodities including the precious metals and leaving in its transactions but little foreign debt such is not now the case aided by the facilities afforded by the banks mere credit has become too commonly the basis of trade many of the banks themselves not content with largely stimulating this system among others have usurped the business while they impair the stability of the mercantile community they have become borrowers instead of lenders they establish their agencies abroad they deal largely in stocks and merchandise they encourage the issue of state securities until the foreign market is glutted with them and unsatisfied with the legitimate use of their own capital and the exercise of their lawful privileges they raise by large loans additional means for every variety of speculation the disasters attendant on this deviation from the former course of business in this country are now shared alike by banks and individuals to an extent of which there is perhaps no previous example in the annals of our country so long as a willingness of the foreign lender and a sufficient export of our productions to meet any necessary partial payments leave the flow of credit undisturbed all appears to be prosperous but as soon as it is checked by any hesitation abroad or by an inability to make payment there in our productions the evils of the system are disclosed the paper currency which might serve for domestic purposes is useless to pay the debt due in europe gold and silver are therefore drawn in exchange for their notes from the banks to keep up their supply of coin these institutions are obliged to call upon their own debtors who pay them principally in their own notes which are as unavailable to them as they are to the merchants to meet the foreign demand the calls of the banks therefore in such emergencies of necessity exceed that demand and produce a corresponding curtailment of their accommodations and of the currency at the very moment when the state of trade renders it most inconvenient to be borne the intensity of this pressure on the community is in proportion to the previous liberality of credit and consequent expansion of the currency forced sales of property are made at the time when the means of purchasing are most reduced and the worst calamities to individuals are only at last arrested by an open violation of their obligations by the banks a refusal to pay specie for their notes and an imposition upon the community of a fluctuating and depreciated currency these consequences are inherent in the present system they are not influenced by the banks being large or small created by national or state governments they are the results of the irresistible laws of trade or credit in the recent events which have so strikingly illustrated the certain effects of these laws we have seen the bank of the largest capital in the union established under a national charter and lately strengthened as we were authoritatively informed by exchanging that for a state charter with new and unusual privileges in a condition too as it was said of entire soundness and great prosperity not merely unable to resist these effects but the first to yield to them nor is it to be overlooked that there exists a chain of necessary dependence among these institutions which obliges them to a great extent to follow the course of others notwithstanding its injustice to their own immediate creditors or injury to the particular community in which they are placed this dependence of a bank which is in proportion to the extent of its debts for circulation and deposits is not merely on others in its own vicinity but on all those which connect it with the center of trade distant banks may fail without seriously affecting those in our principal commercial cities but the failure of the latter is felt at the extremities of the union the suspension at new york in eighteen thirty seven was everywhere with very few exceptions followed as soon as it was known 
that recently at philadelphia immediately affected the banks of the south and west in a similar manner this dependence of our whole banking system on the institutions in a few large cities is not found in the laws of their organization but in those of trade and exchange the banks at that center to which currency flows and where it is required in payments for merchandise hold the power of controlling those in regions whence it comes while the latter possess no means of restraining them so that the value of individual property and the prosperity of trade through the whole interior of the country are made to depend on the good or bad management of the banking institutions in the great seats of trade and the seaboard but this chain of dependence does not stop here it does not terminate in philadelphia or new york it reaches across the ocean and ends in london the center of the credit system the same laws of trade which give to the banks in our principal cities power over the whole banking system of the united states subject the former in their turn to the money power in great britain it is not denied that the suspension of the new york banks in eighteen thirty seven which was followed in quick succession throughout the union was produced by an application of that power and it is now alleged in extenuation of the present condition of so large a portion of our banks that their embarrassments have arisen from the same cause from this influence they cannot now entirely escape for it has its origin in the credit currencies of the two countries it is strengthened by the current of trade and exchange which centers in london and is rendered almost irresistible by the large debts contracted there by our merchants our banks and our states it is thus that an introduction of a new bank into the most distant of our villages places the business of that village within the influence of the money power in england it is thus that every new debt which we contract in that country seriously affects our own currency and extends over the pursuits of our citizens its powerful influence we cannot escape from this by making new banks great or small state or national the same chains which bind those now existing to the center of this system of paper credit must equally fetter every similar institution we create it is only by the extent to which this system has been pushed of late that we have been made fully aware of its irresistible tendency to subject our own banks and currency to a vast controlling power in a foreign land and it adds a new argument to those which illustrate their precarious situation endangered in the first place by their own mismanagement and again by the conduct of every institution which connects them with the center of trade in our own country they are yet subjected beyond all this to the effect of whatever measures policy necessity or caprice may induce those who control the credits of england to resort to i mean not to comment upon these measures present or past and much less to discourage the prosecution of fair commercial dealing between the two countries based on reciprocal benefits but it having now been made manifest that the power of inflicting these and similar injuries is by the resistless law of a credit currency and credit trade equally capable of extending their consequences through all the ramifications of our banking system and by that means indirectly obtaining particularly when our banks are used as depositories of the public monies a dangerous political influence in the united states i have deemed it my duty to bring the subject to your notice and ask for it your serious consideration is an argument required beyond the exposition of these facts to show the impropriety of using our banking institutions as depositories of the public money can we venture not only to encounter the risk of their individual and mutual mismanagement but at the same time to place our foreign and domestic policy entirely under the control of a foreign moneyed interest to do so is to impair the independence of our government as the present credit system has already impaired the independence of our banks it is to submit all its important operations whether of peace or war to be controlled or thwarted at first by our own banks and then by a power abroad greater than themselves i cannot bring myself to depict the humiliation to which this government and people might be sooner or later reduced if the means for defending their rights are to be made dependent upon those who may have the most powerful of motives to impair them nor is it only in reference to the effect of this state of things on the independence of our government or of our banks that the subject presents itself for consideration it is to be viewed also in its relations to the general trade of our country the time is not long past when a deficiency of foreign crops was thought to afford a profitable market for the surplus of our industry but now we await with feverish anxiety the news of the english harvest not so much from the motives of commendable sympathy but fearful lest its anticipated failure should narrow the field of credit there does this not speak volumes to the patriot 
can a system be beneficent wise or just which creates greater anxiety for interest dependent on foreign credit than for the general prosperity of our own country and the profitable exportation of the surplus produce of our labor the circumstances to which i have thus adverted appear to me to afford weighty reasons developed by late events to be added to those which i have on former occasions offered when submitting to your better knowledge and discernment the propriety of separating the custody of the public money from banking institutions nor has anything occurred to lessen in my opinion the force of what has been heretofore urged the only ground on which that custody can be desired by the banks is the profitable use which they may make of the money such use would be regarded in individuals as a breach of trust or a crime of great magnitude and yet it may be reasonably doubted whether first and last it is not attended with more mischievous consequences when permitted to the former than to the latter the practice of permitting the public money to be used by its keepers as here is believed to be peculiar to this country and to exist scarcely anywhere else to procure it here improper influences are appealed to unwise connections are established between the government and vast numbers of powerful state institutions other motives than the public good are brought to bear both on the executive and legislative departments and selfish combinations leading to special legislation are formed it is made the interest of banking institutions and their stockholders throughout the union to use their exertions for the increase of taxation and the accumulation of a surplus revenue and while an excuse is afforded the means are furnished for those excessive issues which lead to extravagant trading and speculation and are the forerunners of a vast debt abroad and a suspension of the banks at home impressed therefore as i am with the propriety of the funds of the government being withdrawn from the private use of either banks or individuals and the public money kept by duly appointed public agents and believing as i do that such also is the judgment which discussion reflection and experience have produced on the public mind i leave the subject with you it is at all events essential to the interests of the community and the business of the government that a decision should be made most of the arguments that dissuade us from employing banks in the custody and disbursement of the public money apply with equal force to the receipt of their notes for public dues the difference is only in form in one instance the government is a creditor for its deposits and in the other for the notes it holds they afford the same opportunity for using the public monies and equally lead to all the evils attendant upon it since a bank can as safely extend its discounts on a deposit of its notes in the hands of a public officer as on one made in its own vaults on the other hand it would give to the government no greater security for in case of failure the claim of the note holder would be no better than that of a depositor i am aware that the danger of inconvenience to the public and unreasonable pressure upon sound banks have been urged as objections to requiring the payment of the revenue in gold and silver these objections have been greatly exaggerated from the best estimates we may safely fix the amount of specie in the country at eighty five million dollars and the portion of that which would be employed at any one time in the receipts and disbursements of the government even if the proposed change were made at once would not it is now after fuller investigation believed to exceed four or five millions if the change were gradual several years would elapse before that sum would be required with annual opportunities in the meantime to alter the law should experience prove it to be oppressive or inconvenience the portions of the community on whose business the change would immediately operate are comparatively small nor is it believed that its effect would be in the least unjust or injurious to them in the payment of duties which constitute by far the greater portion of the revenue a very large proportion is derived from foreign commission houses and agents of foreign manufacturers who sell the goods consigned to them generally at auction and after paying the duties out of the avails remit the rest abroad in specie or its equivalent that the amount of duties should in such cases be also retained in specie can hardly be made a matter of complaint our own importing merchants by whom the residue of the duties is paid are not only peculiarly interested in maintaining a sound currency which the measure in question will especially promote but are from the nature of their dealings best able to know when specie will be needed and to procure it with the least difficulty or sacrifice residing too almost universally in places where the revenue is received and where the drafts used by the government for its disbursements must concentrate they have every opportunity to obtain and use them in place of specie should it be for their interest or convenience 
of the number of these drafts and the facilities they may afford as well as of the rapidity with which the public funds are drawn and dispersed an idea may be formed from the fact that of nearly twenty million dollars paid to collectors and receivers during the present year the average amount in their hands at any one time has not exceeded a million and a half and of the fifteen millions received by the collector of new york alone during the present year the average amount held by him subject to draft during each week has been less than half a million the ease and safety of the operations of the treasury in keeping the public money are promoted by the application of its own drafts to the public dues the objection arising from having them too long outstanding might be obviated and they yet made to afford to merchants and banks holding them an equivalent for specie and in that way greatly lessen the amount actually required still less inconvenience will attend the requirement of specie in purchases of public lands such purchases except when made on speculation are in general but single transactions rarely repeated by the same person and it is a fact that for the last year and a half during which the notes of sound banks have been received more than a moiety of these payments has been voluntarily made in specie being a larger proportion than would have been required in three years under the graduation proposed it is moreover a principle than which none is better settled by experience that the supply of the precious metals will always be found adequate to the uses for which they are required they abound in countries where no other currency is allowed in our own states where small notes are excluded gold and silver supply their place when driven to their hiding places by bank suspensions a little firmness in the community soon restores them in a sufficient quantity for ordinary purposes postage and other public dues have been collected in coin without serious inconvenience even in states where a depreciated paper currency has existed for years and this with the aid of treasury notes for a part of the time was done without interruption during the suspension of eighteen thirty seven at the present moment the receipts and disbursements of the government are made in legal currency in the largest portion of the union no one suggested departure from this rule and if it can now be successfully carried out it will be surely attended with even less difficulty when bank notes are again redeemed in specie indeed i cannot think that a serious objection would anywhere be raised to the receipt and payment of gold and silver in all public transactions were it not from an apprehension that a surplus in the treasury might withdraw a large portion of it from circulation and lock it up unprofitably in the public vaults it would not in my opinion be difficult to prevent such an inconvenience from occurring but the authentic statements which i have already submitted to you in regard to the actual amount in the public treasury at any one time during the period embraced in them and the little probability of a different state of the treasury for at least some years to come seem to render it unnecessary to dwell upon it congress moreover as i have before observed will in every year have an opportunity to guard against it should the occurrence of any circumstances lead us to apprehend injuries from this source viewing the subject in all its aspects i cannot believe that any period will be more auspicious than the present for the adoption of all measures necessary to maintain the sanctity of our own engagements and to aid in securing to the community that abundant supply of the precious metals which add so much to their prosperity and gives such increased stability to all their dealings in a country so commercial as ours banks in some form will probably always exist but this serves only to render it the more incumbent on us notwithstanding the discouragements of the past to strive in our respective stations to mitigate the evils they produce to take from them as rapidly as the obligations of public faith and a careful consideration of the immediate interests of the community will permit the unjust character of monopolies to check so far as may be practicable by prudent legislation those temptations of interest and those opportunities for their dangerous indulgence which beset them on every side and to confine them strictly to the performance of their paramount duty that of aiding the operations of commerce rather than consulting their own exclusive advantage these and other salutary reforms may it is believed be accomplished without the violation of any of the great principles of the social compact the observance of which is indispensable to its existence or interfering in any way with the useful and profitable employment of real capital institutions so framed have existed and still exist elsewhere giving to commercial intercourse all necessary facilities without inflating or depreciating the currency or stimulating speculation thus accomplishing their legitimate ends they have gained the surest guarantee for their protection and encouragement in the good will of the community among a people so just as ours the same results could not fail to attend a similar course the direct supervision of the banks belongs from the nature of our government to the states who authorize them 
it is to their legislatures that the people must mainly look for action on that subject but as the conduct of the federal government in the management of its revenue has also a powerful though less immediate influence upon them it becomes our duty to see that a proper direction is given to it while the keeping of the public revenue in a separate and independent treasury and of collecting it in gold and silver will have a salutary influence on the system of paper credit with which all banks are connected and thus aid those that are sound and well managed it will at the same time sensibly check such as are otherwise by at once withholding the means of extravagance afforded by the public funds and restraining them from excessive issues of notes which they would be constantly called upon to redeem i am aware it has been urged that this control may be best attained and exerted by means of a national bank the constitutional objections which i am well known to entertain would prevent me in any event from proposing or assenting to that remedy but in addition to this i cannot after past experience bring myself to think that it can any longer be extensively regarded as effective for such a purpose the history of the late national bank through all its mutations shows that it was not so on the contrary it may after a careful consideration of the subject be i think safely stated that at every period of banking excess it took the lead that in eighteen seventeen and eighteen eighteen in eighteen twenty three in eighteen thirty one and in eighteen thirty four its vast expansions followed by distressing contractions led to those of the state institutions it swelled and maddened the tides of the banking system but seldom allayed or safely directed them at a few periods only was a salutary control exercised but an eager desire on the contrary exhibited for profit in the first place and if afterwards its measures were severe toward other institutions it was because its own safety compelled it to adopt them it did not differ from them in principle or in form its measures emanated from the same spirit of gain it felt the same temptation to over issues it suffered from and was totally unable to avert those inevitable laws of trade by which it was itself afflicted equally with them and at least on one occasion at an early day it was saved only by extraordinary exertions from the same fate that attended the weakest institution it professed to supervise in eighteen thirty seven it failed equally with others in redeeming its notes though the two years allowed by its charter for that purpose had not expired a large amount of which remains to the present time outstanding it is true that having so vast a capital and strengthened by the use of all the revenues of the government it possessed more power but while it was itself by that circumstance freed from the control which all banks require its paramount object and inducement were left the same to make the most for its stockholders not to regulate the currency of the country nor has it as far as we are advised been found to be greatly otherwise elsewhere the national character given to the bank of england has not prevented excessive fluctuations in their currency and it proved unable to keep off a suspension of specie payments which lasted for nearly a quarter of a century and why should we expect it to be otherwise a national institution though deriving its charter from a different source than the state banks is yet constituted upon the same principles is conducted by men equally exposed to temptation and is liable to the same disasters with the additional disadvantage that its magnitude occasions an extent of confusion and distress which the mismanagement of smaller institutions could not produce it can scarcely be doubted that the recent suspension of the united state bank of pennsylvania of which the effects are felt not in that state alone but over half the union had its origin in a course of business commenced while it was a national institution and there is no good reason for supposing that the same consequences would not have followed had it still derived its power from the general government it is in vain when the influences and impulses are the same to look for a difference in conduct or results by such creations we do therefore but increase the mass of paper credit and paper currency without checking their attendant evils and fluctuations the extent of power and the efficiency of organization which we give so far from being beneficial are in practice positively injurious they strengthen the chain of dependence throughout the union subject all parts more certainly to common disaster and bind every bank more effectually in the first instance to those of our commercial cities and in the end to a foreign power in a word i cannot but believe that with the full understanding of the operations of our banking system which experience has produced public sentiment is not less opposed to the creation of a national bank for purposes connected with currency and commerce than for those connected with the fiscal operations of the government 
yet the commerce and currency of the country are suffering evils from the operations of the state banks which cannot and ought not to be overlooked by their means we have been flooded with a depreciated paper which it was evidently the design of the framers of the constitution to prevent when they required congress to coin money and regulate the value of foreign coins and when they forbade the states to coin money emit bills of credit make anything but gold and silver a tender in payments of debts or pass any law impairing the obligation of contracts if they did not guard more explicitly against the present state of things it was because they could not have anticipated that the few banks then existing were to swell to an extent which would expel to so great a degree the gold and silver for which they have provided from the channels of circulation and fill them with a currency that defeats the objects they had in view the remedy for this must chiefly rest with the states from whose legislation it has sprung no good that might accrue in a particular case front the exercise of powers not obviously conferred on the general government would authorize its interference or justify a course that might in the slightest degree increase at the expense of the states the power of the federal authorities nor do i doubt that the states will apply the remedy within the last few years events have appealed to them too strongly to be disregarded they have seen that the constitution though theoretically adhered to is subverted in practice that while on the statute books there is no legal tender but gold and silver no law impairing the obligation of contracts yet that in point of fact the privileges conferred on the banking corporations have made their notes the currency of the country that the obligations imposed by these notes are violated under the impulses of interest or convenience and that the number and power of the persons connected with these corporations or placed under their influence give them a fearful weight when their interest is in opposition to the spirit of the constitution and laws to the people it is immaterial whether these results are produced by open violations of the latter or by the workings of a system of which the result is the same an inflexible execution even of the existing statutes of most of the states would redress many evils now endured would effectually show the banks the dangers of mismanagement which impunity encourages them to repeat and would teach all corporations the useful lesson that they are the subjects of the law and the servants of the people what is still wanting to effect these objects must be sought in additional legislation or if that be inadequate in such further constitutional grants or restrictions as may bring us back into the path from which we have so widely wandered in the meantime it is the duty of the general government to cooperate with the states by a wise exercise of its constitutional powers and the enforcement of its existing laws the extent to which it may do so by further enactments i have already adverted to and the wisdom of congress may yet enlarge them but above all it is incumbent upon us to hold erect the principles of morality and law constantly executing our own contracts in accordance with the provisions of the constitution and thus serving as a rallying point by which our whole country may be brought back to that safe and honored standard our people will not long be insensible to the extent of the burdens entailed upon them by the false system that has been operating on their sanguine energetic and industrious character nor to the means necessary to extricate themselves from these embarrassments the weight which presses upon a large portion of the people and the states is an enormous debt foreign and domestic the foreign debt of our states corporations and men of business can scarcely be less than two hundred million dollars requiring more than ten million dollars a year to pay the interest this sum has to be paid out of the exports of the country and must of necessity cut off imports to that extent or plunge the country more deeply in debt from year to year it is easy to see that the increase of this foreign debt must augment the annual demand on the export to pay the interest and to the same extent diminish the imports and in proportion to the enlargement of the foreign debt and the consequent increase of interest must be the decrease of the import trade in lieu of the comforts which it now brings us we might have our gigantic banking institutions and splendid but in many instances profitless railroads and canals absorbing to a great extent in interest upon the capital borrowed to construct them the surplus fruits of the national industry for years to come and securing to posterity no adequate return for the comforts which the labors of their hands might otherwise have secured it is not by the increase of this debt that relief is to be sought but in its diminution upon this point there is i am happy to say hope before us not so much in the return of confidence abroad which will enable the states to borrow more money as in a change of public feeling at home 
which prompts our people to pause in their career and think of the means by which debts are to be paid before they are contracted if we would escape embarrassment public and private we must cease to run in debt except for objects of necessity or such as will yield a certain return let the faith of the states corporations and individuals already pledged be kept with the most punctilious regard it is due to our national character as well as to justice that this should on the part of each be a fixed principle of conduct but it behooves us all to be more chary in pledging it hereafter by ceasing to run in debt and applying the surplus of our crops and incomes to the discharge of existing obligations buying less and selling more and managing all affairs public and private with strict economy and frugality we shall see our country soon recover from a temporary depression arising not from natural and permanent causes but from those i have enumerated and advance with renewed vigor in her career of prosperity fortunately for us at this moment when the balance of trade is greatly against us and the difficulty of meeting it enhanced by the disturbed state of our money affairs the bounties of providence have come to relieve us from the consequences of past errors a faithful application of the immense results of the labors of the last season will afford partial relief for the present and perseverance in the same course will in due season accomplish the rest we have had full experience in times past of the extraordinary results which can in this respect be brought about in a short period by the united and well-directed efforts of a community like ours our surplus profits the energy and industry of our population and the wonderful advantages which providence has bestowed upon our country in its climate its various productions indispensable to other nations will in due time afford abundant means to perfect the most useful of those objects for which the states have been plunging themselves of late in embarrassment and debt without imposing on ourselves or our children such fearful burdens but let it be indelibly engraved on our minds that relief is not to be found in expedients indebtedness cannot be lessened by borrowing more money or by changing the form of the debt the balance of trade is not to be turned in our favor by creating new demands upon us abroad our currency cannot be improved by the creation of new banks or more issues from those which now exist although these devices sometimes appear to give temporary relief they almost invariably aggravate the evil in the end it is only by retrenchment and reform by curtailing public and private expenditures by paying our debts and by reforming our banking system that we are to expect effectual relief security for the future and an enduring prosperity in shaping the institutions and policy of the general government so as to promote as far as it can with its limited powers these important ends you may rely on my most cordial cooperation that there should have been in the progress of recent events doubts in many quarters and in some a heated opposition to every change cannot surprise us doubts are properly attendant on all reform and it is peculiarly in the nature of such abuses as we are now encountering to seek to perpetuate their power by means of the influence they have been permitted to acquire it is their result if not their object to gain for the few an ascendancy over the many by securing to them a monopoly of the currency the medium through which most of the wants of mankind are supplied to produce throughout society a chain of dependence which leads all classes to look to privileged associations for the means of speculation and extravagance to nourish in preference to the manly virtues that give dignity to human nature a craving desire for luxurious enjoyment and sudden wealth which renders those who seek them dependent on those who supply them to substitute for republican simplicity and economical habits a sickly appetite for effeminate indulgence and an imitation of that reckless extravagance which impoverished and enslaved the industrious people of foreign lands and at last to fix upon us instead of those equal political rights the acquisition of which was alike the object and supposed reward of our revolutionary struggle a system of exclusive privileges conferred by partial legislation to remove the influences which had thus gradually grown up among us to deprive them of their deceptive advantages to test them by the light of wisdom and truth to oppose the force which they concentrate in their support all this was necessarily the work of time even among a people so enlightened and pure as that of the united states in most other countries perhaps it could only be accomplished through that series of revolutionary movements which are too often found necessary to effect any great and radical reform but it is the crowning merit of our institutions that they create and nourish in the vast majority of our people a disposition and a power peaceably to remedy abuses which have elsewhere caused the effusion of rivers of blood and the sacrifice of thousands of the human race the result thus far is most honorable to the self-denial the intelligence and the patriotism of our citizens 
it justifies the confident hope that they will carry through the reform which has been so well begun and that they will go still further than they have yet gone in illustrating the important truth that a people as free and enlightened as ours will whenever it becomes necessary show themselves to be indeed capable of self-government by voluntarily adopting appropriate remedies for every abuse and submitting to temporary sacrifices however great to ensure their permanent welfare my own exertions for the furtherance of these desirable objects have been bestowed throughout my official career with a zeal that is nourished by ardent wishes for the welfare of my country and by an unlimited reliance on the wisdom that marks its ultimate decision on all great and controverted questions impressed with the solemn obligations imposed upon me by the constitution desirous also of laying before my fellow citizens with whose confidence and support i have been so highly honored such measures as appear to me conducive to their prosperity and anxious to submit to their fullest consideration the grounds upon which my opinions are formed i have on this as on preceding occasions freely offered my views on those points of domestic policy that seem at the present time most prominently to require the action of the government i know that they will receive from congress that full and able consideration which the importance of the subject merits and i can repeat the assurance heretofore made that i shall cheerfully and readily cooperate with you in every measure that will tend to promote the welfare of the union m van buren end of section seven